Madonna single-handedly changed the complexion of the world's musical landscape in the early 90s as a band that encapsulated the zeitgeist of Generation X. But their time on top of the music world was very brief due to the shocking death of their guitarist and frontman Kurt Cobain. The band rose from the Seattle grunge scene during the late 80s which presented a dirtier, grittier, and rawer alternative to the polished, glammed up image of hair metal that dominated the airwaves at the time. Little did they know that they would eventually lead the grunge movement, shape pop culture, and become the spokespersons for an entire generation through their song. Even years after their untimely demise, they continued to influence rising bands, and their short but impacting story remains one of the most discussed tales in rock history. How did Nirvana establish themselves as rock titans and become the stuff of rock legend? Keep watching as we look back on the story of Nirvana, from their mainstream rise to their tragic fall and the lasting legacy they left on the music world. Formation and Early Years Nirvana became the biggest rock band in the world in 1991 and the faces that represented an entire generation. But for founder Kurt Cobain, all he wanted was to play music in a band. Nirvana was the brainchild of Kurt, who was born and raised in Aberdeen, Washington. He became interested in music at a very young age and started playing the piano at four. However, when he was nine, his parents divorced, significantly impacting his life and changing his personality. He became defiant and rebellious towards adults, and he dealt negatively with them throughout his youth. Kurt attended Aberdeen High School, where he met Chris Novoselic and invited him to start a musical project. Three years after their first meeting, Chris accepted Kurt's invitation. They played in a few bands with different members at first, before laying the foundations for what would eventually become Nirvana. In January 1988, the band recorded its first demos with drummer Dale Crover from the Melvins. The band went through numerous drummers during this period before settling on Chad Channing, who was introduced to them by a friend. In November of 1988, the band released their first ever single, a cover of Shocking Blue's song, Love Buzz. The single was released through Sub Pop, an independent label known for giving many bands from the Seattle grunge scene their start. Nirvana became the first musical act to have an extended contract with Sub Pop. Nirvana began working on their debut album with producer Jack Endino, who had a hand in producing for many Seattle grunge bands. Nirvana released its debut album, Bleach, in June of 1989. The album was a moderate success, gaining traction via college radio airplay and word of mouth in the underground scene. It ended up being Sub Pop's highest selling release, but the label didn't market and promote the album any further to the frustration of Kurt. Nirvana embarked on its first nationwide tour to support the album, but had to cancel the tour's final dates due to growing tension with the band's second guitarist at the time, Jason Everman. Eventually, Everman quit and the band returned to being a three-piece. In 1990, Nirvana began making preparations for their second album. The band hired Butch Vig to produce their next record at the suggestion of Sub Pop's head, Bruce Pavitt. However, while recording new material, conflicts were beginning to arise between drummer Chad Channing and the rest of the band. Kurt and Chris felt that Chad's drumming wasn't up to par, while Chad complained about not being involved in the songwriting process enough. Chad exited the group after they concluded a short tour which started in April of 1990. As a result, recording sessions for the new album were paused. In September 1990, the Melvins' Buzz Osborne introduced Kurt and Chris to Dave Grohl, the drummer for Washington DC-based hardcore punk band Scream. By that time, Scream had abruptly disbanded, and with no other musical projects, Dave traveled to Seattle to audition for Nirvana. Dave subsequently became the band's drummer until their disbandment mainstream breakthrough with Nevermind. Later that year, Nirvana signed with major level DGC Records after receiving advice from Kim Gordon of Sonic Youth and Susan Silver who managed fellow Seattle acts Soundgarden and Alice in Chains. Butch Vig remained as the band's producer and the new label gave them $65,000 to record their new album. The band commenced work on the album from May to June of 1991. On September 10, 1991, Nirvana released the single from their new album, Smells Like Teen Spirit. The song and its accompanying music video steadily gained popularity thanks to heavy radio airplay and MTV airtime. 
The single eventually peaked at number six on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100. 14 days later, on September 24, 1991, Nirvana released their second studio album, Nevermind. Bolstered by the massive success of Smells Like Teen Spirit, the album's sales picked up over the next few weeks. By November, Nevermind placed at number 35 on the Billboard Top 40, with no signs of slowing down. Nirvana experienced their first sold-out shows in Europe, and increased media coverage as the album and Smells Like Teen Spirit quickly took the world by storm. By January 1992, Nirvana had become so big that it toppled Michael Jackson for the top spot at the Billboard charts. No rock band had achieved such massive success before. Nevermind later became known as the album that launched Nirvana into the mainstream stratosphere, introducing grunge to the mainstream and opening doors for alternative rock to dominate the airwaves. It established the genre as the next big thing in rock after hair metal, and Nirvana were regarded as trendsetters and culture shapers for a new generation. Despite being the de facto leaders of this musical revolution, Nirvana didn't mind the increase in their celebrity status. They also didn't embark on an extension of their supporting tour for the album due to exhaustion. The band nearly disbanded at the height of their popularity when Kurt wanted a bigger share of the group's songwriting royalties since he wrote most of their music. He wanted this agreement to be retroactive to Nevermind's release. Kurt prevailed and received a retroactive 75% of the band's royalties, resulting in tensions between the members for an extended period of time. Despite this, the band continued moving forward and ended rumors of a breakup by headlining the Reading Festival in 1992. Their performance at the event is widely regarded as one of the band's best, but it was also their final onstage appearance in the UK. That same year, Nirvana received the Best Alternative Video and Best New Artist Award at the MTV Video Music Awards. Expectations for Nirvana's next effort were high due to Nevermind's success. However, true to their nature as a grunge act, Nirvana wasn't exactly pleased with how their previous album sounded. Kurt thought it sounded too clean and polished and aimed for a dirtier sound for their next album. To accomplish this goal, the band hired Steve Albini of the noise rock band Big Black as their producer. The band recorded their album in February 1993 over a period of two weeks. The result was In Utero, released in September 1993. The album debuted at number one on the Billboard 200, their first and only studio album to do so. Despite its uncommercial sound, it was highlighted by fans and critics as another victory for the trio. The following month, Nirvana went on tour to support the new album. In November, the band performed for MTV Unplugged. The performance is recognized as a highlight of the band's career, despite the band choosing to perform mostly covers and deep cuts from their albums. The following year, the band went on their final European tour, their last ever concert took place in Munich, Germany on March 1, 1994. The death of Kurt Cobain. Ever since Nirvana made it big, the idealistic Kurt had struggled with reconciling his newfound fame with his anti-establishment personality. Kurt was uncomfortable being tagged by the media as the voice of a generation and resented his celebrity status. Additionally, Kurt struggled with chronic bronchitis and depression, as well as addictions to illegal substances. It's been suggested that Kurt used substances to deal with the debilitating pain from his bronchitis and a chronic stomach illness. When in Rome, Kurt overdosed on a combination of alcohol and rohypnol and was found by his wife Courtney Love. His condition forced the band to cancel their remaining tour dates as Kurt recovered in the hospital. Five days later, he went home to Seattle. During this time, his heroin addiction returned, which severely affected him. His wife phoned the police later that March because Kurt had locked himself in his room with a weapon. As Kurt's mental state worsened, Love had no choice but to arrange an intervention to get her husband to rehab. Kurt agreed to enter a rehabilitation facility in Los Angeles, but after a few days, he escaped and flew back to Seattle, forcing Love to hire a private investigator to locate him. On April 8, 1994, the bloody body of Kurt Cobain was found by an electrician inside his home in Seattle. A shotgun and a suicide note was also found at the scene. Mainstream media immediately picked up on the story, and the news of Kurt's sudden death spread throughout the world like wildfire, while sales of Nirvana records quickly ballooned to the point that stocks were running out in stores. A public vigil was held for the Nirvana frontman on April 10, 1994 at Seattle Park, which was attended by around 7,000 fans. Life After Nirvana Kurt's death became a widely discussed and controversial topic for years, but what was certain was that Nirvana was over. The remaining band members initially tried to work together on music again, but found it too uncomfortable and emotionally taxing. 
Bassist Chris Novoselic focused less on music and more on political activism. On the other hand, Dave Grohl continued his music career by forming the Foo Fighters in 1995, with him as the band's guitarist and vocalist. The Foo Fighters eventually carved a legacy of their own throughout the years, winning 15 Grammy Awards and allowing Dave a second chance to enjoy a wildly successful musical career. Nirvana's classic lineup of Kurt Cobain, Dave Grohl, and Chris Novoselic were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2014. Seven years later, in 2021, the Foo Fighters received the same recognition, making Dave one of the few people to be inducted twice into the Hall of Fame. Although their stint on the top of the music world was brief, Nirvana remains one of the most influential and commercially successful bands of all time. A band that transcended music to become the leaders of a worldwide cultural shift that defined an era.